Here's your meet and greet question of the day. The question is, what's your favorite cat or dog breed? Wow, great question. Okay, I confess, I'm a little biased. I would have to say my dog's breed, Max is a Yorkshire Terrier Poodle, and Molly is a Shih Tzu Pomeranian, known as a Sheranian, and Max is known as a Yorkie Poo. Anyway, um, let's talk about food now. How about food? Now, Gordon Ramsay is one of my all-time favorite chefs in the world. He has a TV show called Master Chef, where amateur and home chefs compete for a huge cash prize and the coveted title Master Chef. And each week, they eliminate a contestant who doesn't bake or cook a good dish. My favorite episode is where a blind woman named Christine Ha competed. And here is what happened in that episode. Christine has the last pie to be tasted before the judges decide who will be sent home. How are you, Christine? I'm all right, Chef. Okay, first of all, I've never seen you that flustered. And then, with barely 18 minutes to go, you still were not in the oven with your apple pie. Honestly, Chef, there's just no excuse. I just was flustered. And I just, I'm not experienced with making pie at all, so there's just really no excuse. What do you think this pie looks like? I think it probably looks like a pile of rubbish. Visually, it looks stunning. It's got a nice, crisp, dark brown color on the edge. Thank you, Chef. The sugar has almost glazed the pastry, and it looks as delicious as Frank's. So stop doubting yourself. Be bold. Yes, okay. Pie underneath. The pastry looks cooked. Can you hear that on top? Yes, Chef. What does that sound like to you? It sounds good and crusty. Good and crusty. So, stop feeling upset with yourself. Okay? You've got to start believing yourself more. Okay? Come on. Come on. Right. Hear that? Yes, Chef. There's not a soggy patch on there. That's all the way around, OK? Can you hear that? On the balcony, you can hear that, right? Yes, 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 yes sir. And it's intact right in front of your very eyes. I have a wedge. Oh, thank God. Of a beautiful apple pie. And the flavour? The flavor's amazing. Okay? It's delicious. So well done. Okay? Congratulations. Really good job. Wow. Well, what happened in that video is what I want to preach today. The importance of knowing there's a power greater than us who sees and confirms our worth in spite of our self-talk that might be detrimental to our health. Or worse yet, in spite of what other people in our lives are telling us that we are not worth much. I'm going to do something different in today's sermon. Normally, I start with the passage we are going to study. And as you know, we're in a lectionary series where there are four passages for this week to choose from to apply practical principles to our lives. Today, I'm going to talk about three of the four scripture passages, but not until the very end. I want to start with a story that will be a reference point for the passages that come later. It's a true story, and it has to do with my family. One of the most fascinating events I watch in television every year is the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show on PBS. It's an all-breed show. And somehow, in a way that baffles me, they pick one dog to say it is the best looking dog of all the dogs who competed that day. I can't figure out how they can say that one dog of that one breed is the best in show. I mean, the judge has to choose from such diverse breeds like a German Shepherd or versus a Bichon Frise or a Terrier or a Pe Pekingese or a Shih Tzu or a Poodle or a 
Be beagle. I was going to say bagel. That, that would be good. Or a spaniel. Or an Afghan hound. Actually, is it Bichon Frise or Bichon Frise? Anyway, the Bichon. Anyway, so I don't get it. How can one possibly say that a dog of one breed is better than all of the other dogs of other breeds that trotted in front of you? Fascinating. But it's the same way with art shows. About 15 years ago, my sister-in-law, Karen, entered one of her paintings in a big juried art show. The judge was a curator of an art museum. Big deal. Karen does abstract oil paintings. I think she's a fabulous painter, and I have two of her paintings in my house. She entered this prestigious contest hoping she might have a showing of one of her pieces, even though many gifted artists were going to contribute their pieces. Her husband, Tony, carried her big painting down to the art show's receiving desk, and there were three women seated there. And when they saw the big painting Tony presented to them, they said to Tony, what is this? And Tony said, well, this is my wife's painting. She wants to enter it into the art show. And one of the women said, this doesn't look like it is finished. And Tony said, it, it is finished. It's abstract. And a woman said, that's not art. Besides, it has no frame. And Tony said, well, for contemporary art, it often has no frame. If you, you, if you go to the Contemporary Art Museum, several of the paintings there have no frames. At that moment, one of the women leaned over and picked a painting in a paper bag at, near her and pulled it up and said, now look, this is art. Look, here is a painting of an apple. You can tell it's an apple. It looks like an apple. And see, it has a frame. And Tony thought to himself, that is one of the gaudiest frames I have ever seen. They said, I'm sorry, but we will not accept your painting. So Tony picked up his painting and walked back to his truck. And what was he going to tell Karen? He was afraid that Karen's feelings would be hurt. And as he was walking through the parking lot, the head director, who was in charge of receiving all of the art to be considered for the show, was walking by and shouted, hey, what are, what are you doing? And Tony explained what just happened. And the director listened and said, I'm sorry. Those women have no right to reject artwork. They're volunteers. They're supposed to just receive all the pieces of art and the appointed authorized juror will decide which ones will be selected for the show and if selected to be considered for the awards. That was not their job to determine which art is accepted or not. They are to accept all the art pieces, whether paintings or sculpture or whatever. All are to be accepted. So just wait here. And the director walked back into the building, talked to the women who were there, Tony was in the hallway looking from afar, and he, he told them that they had to accept Tony's painting. Tony walked back in and handed over the painting. And as he was leaving, one of the women said, oh, don't forget when you receive the phone call, come back and pick up your painting right away. You see, the system was that if you get a phone call, it meant that the judges rejected your piece to even be shown and you need to pick it up. But if you didn't get a call, then your artwork has been accepted to be displayed in the show and can be a candidate for some award, like you know, best sculpture, or best watercolor, or best oil painting, or best mixed media, etc. So Tony thought it was kind of mean that they still felt Karen's work was not good enough and should be rejected, and they just had to remind him not to forget to pick up Karen's painting when he gets the phone call, which they anticipated he was going to get. Well, Karen and Tony never got a phone call, so they assumed their painting was accepted. On the inaugural night of the show, Tony and Karen went down, and as they walked in, those same three women went up to Tony and said, 
Mr. Lee, it is so good to see you. Welcome. Make sure you get a bite to eat and please go to the food table. And Tony like shook his head and thought, how unusual that they're so friendly and polite right now, so different from the other day. So they walked in and they began to look at the program bulletin that showed who was showing and you know, where the art pieces were placed. But the program also showed who were the winners of the various media and which piece the juror selected as best in show, the best artwork above all the other items shown. And lo and behold, Karen's painting was awarded best in show. They were stunned. They couldn't believe it. Of all the items, of all the different media, her painting was named best in show. What was initially rejected as not even being good enough to submit was chosen as best in show. Okay, so what's the point, Dan? What's the metaphor? Well, there's so many points I want to make. First of all, who are we to judge others? Jesus said we're not to judge other people. Jesus is like the director of receivership who would say to all of us Tonys, all are accepted of all genres, of all colors, of all backgrounds, of all education or lack thereof. All are accepted. Only God knows our true value and worth. You don't need a golden gilded frame around you. Don't need to be dressed well or have a title. Don't need to be rich or educated. Whether with a frame or without a frame, we are all valued by God and are welcome in his kingdom if we accept his invitation. Going back to Gordon Ramsay and the blind chef Christine Ha, Sometimes we're like Christine, aren't we? We think our pie, our accomplishments are but trash, and we're blind to their worth. We may think we're the worst parent in the world, or our self-talk is that we'll never amount to anything. We're no good, we're not smart enough, we're not pretty enough, we're not athletic enough, I'm single, no one will love me, I'm all alone. Negative self-talk is like self-cutting. We desperately need a true authority who knows what he's talking about. A Gordon Ramsay or an art show jurist who says, your work is not trash and you are of infinite worth. Who will that person be in our lives? Second, there will be those who will judge you. Like the three women at the receiving desk who are like Job's three friends, there are people in your life who will reject your worth. They don't give you a fair chance. They don't give you value. Even Jesus, who was perfect in every way and who was God here on earth, he was scorned, he was betrayed. He was judged unfairly. He got an unfair trial. He was ridiculed. He was gossiped about. He was perfect for crying out loud. So why do we think we will be exempt from unfair judgment if the perfect Lord got judged so often? How many of us have had a hurtful past? Maybe you had someone in your life who didn't believe in your worth. Maybe a coach, maybe a parent, a so-called friend, a, a boss, a subordinate, a colleague. Maybe you applied for a job and have been rejected many, many times. And we start the self-talk in our minds that we, we are just junk, we're trash, we're of no good. And maybe like the three women at the receiving desk of the art show, some people want to remind you to expect rejection. And you should get rejection. And when you get the phone call of dismissal to get your stuff, then get it and get out. Oh, wait, 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 wait. By the way, it occurs to me that maybe you want to see Karen's painting, the one that won best show, best in show. Would you like to see it? with the judge declared as better than all the other pieces that day, with the judge declared as best in show. You ready? You ready? Okay. Here it is. There it is. 
Look at it. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I know. You may be thinking like the three women. What is that? Yes, it's abstract, but every brush stroke and image and object has meaning. Yes, it's, it's not an apple. It's not still life. It's real life in a way that many may not understand. And the art show jurist, a curator of a great museum, could see that and crowned it best in show. But here's the deal. I believe many of us think in the abstract. We are, we are abstract. We are asymmetrical. We have weird ideas, not necessarily linear. And that, but that may be hard for others to understand. Maybe our thinking is at times a little ADD or ADHD, or maybe it might seem bipolar or schizophrenic to others. And publicly, we try so hard to present the apple, that still life, with a nice frame. And we want to look good. We want to fit in. We want to be understandable. But deep inside, our feelings, our thoughts, may seem jumbled or just different than others. But here's my point. Jesus knows you, and it is he who has the expertise and the authority to determine your value and worth, your true value and worth. And Jesus Christ is real. He is God who came to earth to die in our place. He is the true expert chef Gordon Ramsay, or the art show jurist, who knows what he's talking about. And Jesus says, I know you. I got you in my arms. You're of great value and great worth. And as far as I'm concerned, you'll always be best in show, in my eyes. And I would give my life for you. You know what? He did. <laughs> you know, I just know from being your pastor, for many years, that many of us have hurts and scars from words said that were harmful or wounding to our souls. And while sometimes wise words can hurt us, there are words that are almost wicked, and they are given with the intent to hurt and take you from the Lord. Now, clearly, hear me out. I'm not saying that women at the receiving table were wicked. But I am talking about those who delight in judging and criticizing us unfairly. Now, here are the passages that were in our lectionary that by God's will were planned for today for us to study. And you will see how it all comes together in God's word. Now, with my art story for context and a reference point, here are the words now of Psalm 1, the very first psalm in the Bible. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Ah, but not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Wow. So did you hear that? There are mean people in this world, and that's a fact. And we must trust God that he will take care of those people in his due time. Vengeance is not ours. It is the Lord's, the Bible says. He will take care of them. There are mean people in our lives who will judge us unfairly. Don't hang out with them. Don't listen to them. Their words come more from wrongful negativity than from the encouraging, refreshing blessings from God. Jesus is the healer. And if someone has physically hurt you, know that what was done to you was wicked, and it wasn't your fault. God, the great judge, will deal with them. But for now, he wants to help you and heal you and 
give you the true words of your value and worth. This is a hurtful world. This is not heaven. There are mean people. There are wicked people. And as the Bible says, they are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind, and they will be condemned at the time of judgment. And what they have said or done does not diminish your worth or value one little bit. And I believe there are people out there who need to hear this message today. When people feel they aren't important, that they will not amount to anything, that they think they're not pretty or handsome or smart, that those words are wicked thoughts and not from Jesus. The Lord is not putting those thoughts in your mind. Jesus is saying, be deaf to their words and be open to his words of healing and value and significance. Now, here comes the next passage. The words of Jesus in chapter 17 in the Gospel of John. Jesus is about to be arrested and then executed. And he talks in a loving way to God, our Heavenly Father, about his disciples. Here's what he says. I have revealed you to the ones who gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to them the message you have given me, you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you, and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. And all who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I'm departing for the world. They are staying in this world, but I'm coming to you. Holy Father, you've given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name, so they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. And that's Judas he was talking about. Man, the pathos of the story. Jesus is about to be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He wanted to get one more prayer out before he is captured. He wanted to talk about his friends, his disciples, and pray for them. And 2,000 years later, we can know that he is talking about us in the same way. This passage is so rich. Jesus says in verse 9, he has been praying for all those whom God has given him. You're in his flock. He talked of his desire to protect you by the power of his name. He desires to guard you. And then he closes with these tear-provoking words in verse 19. He says, and I give myself as a sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Friends, there is no greater love than one who gives his life for another. And that is what Jesus did for you on the cross. He gave his life for you and now prays for you and desires to help you today and strengthen you and protect you. Just slow down and listen for him and ask for the Holy Spirit to come and feel his presence. And then finally, hear this third passage written by one of Jesus' favorite disciples, John. And here's what he wrote. And hopefully this will make it all come together. He said, since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. And God has testified about his son. All who believe in the son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his son. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I've written this to you who believe in the name 
of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Jesus said in verse 9, you believe in human testimony so easily. And I would add, including the wrong kind. I mean, think about this. If you believe judgment and lies about you so easily, why can't you please, please listen to the words of God? God offers you life, eternal life through Jesus Christ. But it's not life just for the hereafter. Eternal life starts right now. So live in his truth. Live in his love. Live knowing that he values you so much. Have Jesus Christ not as a hobby, but central in your every day. As Pastor Tim said last week, have Jesus as a friend. He is reaching out to you to be his friend. Will you be his? That last passage said, for whoever has the Son has life. Real, true, affirming life. And whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Choose to listen to Jesus and live for him and in him, for he is the one authority who knows your true worth and value. He is the one praying for you. He is the one who longs to protect you, with whom to have a lifelong friendship if you let him. He is the one who understands you and can put order and value in your life, no matter how abstract things may seem. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, it's hard to believe at times that you love us so much. And to be honest, there have been people in our lives who just condemned us or judged us, criticized us, and, and some of us still bear those scars. But if it's true, Lord, that you love us that much, then may we always try to make you central in our lives and accept your friendship. Lord, to be honest, sometimes we just ignore you and we want to say sorry about that. Lord, there may be some here who they've really lived a long time without you. Maybe they used to go to church. Maybe they never have gone to church. Maybe they used to believe in you. Maybe they have doubts now, but maybe some would just want to pray right now. Okay, Lord, this is it. I really want to become a follower of you. And I really want to authentically be in your presence as much as I can every day. I want to know you as friend and my Lord. And Lord, if there are people here who, who just want to say a prayer with me right now and really take that major step of accepting you in their lives, may they just, in the silence of their hearts, just follow along me, along with me, with this prayer. To say, Lord, if you're real, as Dan just talked about, then I do want to dedicate my life to you. I really do want to commit my life to you. And I want to say I'm sorry for maybe ignoring you up till now. And please come into my life. And thank you. Send your Holy Spirit. Thank you. And I want this to be a new day. And Lord, for our people here, where this, this is a first-time decision or a renewal of people's hearts, I know you're hearing their prayers now and you're so happy because by them saying they want to follow you and commit their lives to you, they're affirming that they have heard your words, that they are of great value. They are the treasures in your heart, Lord, 
and we acknowledge that you died for us and you love us that much and that you forgive all of our sins and we have a new day in you. So thank you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. You know, for some of you, maybe it's a first-time commitment. Um, maybe you can hit that button that's on your screen right now that said, I commit my life to, to Christ. Um, maybe some of you want prayer right now. Something's stirring in your heart. The Holy Spirit's talking to you. And hit that button maybe right now and that says you want prayer. And these wonderful, loving people are in the other line. And you'll get to talk to one of them. And, and you can pray with them and just confirm this major decision. Sometimes when we make major decisions, it's good to confirm it with somebody. You know, as we talk about all of these things, about how much God loves us, and our worth is not what I own or, or what people tell me or my self-talk is saying all the time. Um, but um, before you leave, I have a blessing for you. So please receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and its countenance be upon you. And may you know deep in your hearts the wonderful, deep, infinite, infinite, unconditional love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. God bless. Aloha. Ahuiho. See you next week. I love cats. Cats are wonderful, but I have to admit I'm a little allergic. And Brett the cameraman loves cats, so I have to say I love cats. Oh, oh, hi Brett. I... We noticed that you've been upping your game and you've been getting nicer aloha shirts. <laughs> are you buying them for yourself? Wow, like this is um, a gift. Not that I'm hinting, but this is a gift that somebody got, so I just gave, gave me a gift certificate and. You know, I don't always wear purple, but today I thought I'd wear my white shoes with purple streaks on it. That was really hard to do. I'm going to hurt doing that. <laughs>